There's a couple of people in the front row that said you don't dare to call us by a name. Corey, when I met you like two years ago, I didn't know shit about procurement, so sorry for this. Um, okay, so I'm here talking to all of you, um, or the ones that have left. Um, and you think this is an event about procurement, but if I look at it, for me, this is the Fire Brigade Convention. And you don't want to be the fire brigade, and I'm going to try to prove it. But before we go there, let's talk about a couple of the buzzwords of today. A couple of the buzzwords of today, on one hand, you have ecosystems, and on the other hand, you have impact. And before you say, oh no, I'm going to prove that the two are connected. I'm going to ask you to do something. Take your smartphones. Take your smartphones. You can take them out of your pocket. Don't look at them because then I'll lose you, but take your smartphones. And if you have a neighbor, pass your smartphone to your neighbor. Pass your smartphone to your neighbor. Okay. And keep it like that. Now, you've been building an ecosystem because you've been sharing stuff. And at the same time, you feel the impact. So ecosystems and impact are connected. And it's connected to technology as well because this is about technology. Okay. Now we're there, keep it there, because I'm only going to talk for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, you can have your life back. Um, but in between, you have to listen to me, because you don't want to be the fire brigade. And I'm going to talk to you today about the most important question in business. That is, how, as a procurement department, can you still be relevant for people in society in 2035? And your companies, how can your companies still be relevant for people and society by 2035? And you might look at me and say, Rick, 2035, my God, why are you talking about 2035? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Who remembers the financial crisis of 2008? Who remembers it? Like it was yesterday, but that's 14 years ago. So 2022 plus 14 is 2036. So conclusion is 2036, so 2035 is just around the corner. If you don't start moving your ass, sorry my wordings, today, nothing is going to happen in six months, nothing is going to happen in three years, it will be 2035 before you know it, and then you say, oh shit, we should have done something about it. And if you don't do anything between now and 2035, you are going to be the fire brigade, and you don't want to be the fire brigade. Luckily, we've realized that something is wrong. Some people say the virus broke the system. The virus didn't break the system. The virus just revealed a broken system. The system was already broken. We're entering not the roaring 20s. We're entering the twilight 20s, a zone in between a dying old normal, the way you've been running procurement for the last, you know, 100 years, it's over. The problem is, or the opportunity, there is no new normal yet. So for some, this will be the zone of monsters and creeps, and for some, this will the zone be the zone of tremendous opportunities. The mistake that we shouldn't make is to think, ooh, we survived. Let's go back to normal. I don't think so, because there is no new normal. There is no normal anymore. If we look back and we had the opportunity when we were in COVID-19, we could look upon our business and I think that most of you have asked the question, what the peep are we doing? What have we been doing? You know, global supply chains? It only took one ship getting stuck in Suez somewhere and the whole supply chain collapsed. And we still haven't figured out how to restart it. So I don't know shit about supply chains, but I know that nobody seems to be able to restart it. And an economy based on endless growth, come on, let's face it. We can't grow endlessly on a limited planet. We're eating our planet for a little bit of profitability. You know, this is what we're doing. We're squeezing the planet. And what we do is to focus on profit. Okay, so you might think, okay, Rick is talking about change. So we need to adapt to change, like Darwin said. But Darwin was completely wrong. Darwin said we have to adapt to change. But we are human beings, and human beings don't adapt to the changing environment. We change the environment. That is something more than just adapting to the environment. And this is what we can do. So eat this, Darwin. You were completely wrong. 
as a business, never just adapt to the environment, because you're always too late. Adapt the environment. And we humans have been adapting our environment to that extent that we kind of lost control. We're no longer in control of this changing environment. And we're going to be confronted with a couple of big issues, like growing wild population, climate collapse, rising sea levels, and the end of an economic system as we've known it. You know, just focusing on profit? I don't think so. Your customers don't want you to just focus on profit. Your customers want you to focus on them. Because what they remember is not what you do, it's not what you say, it's how you make them feel. And so it is about well-being as a company, and you know that, and we've seen that during COVID-19, all companies have to focus on creating well-being. But you can't steal it from the planet. You can't steal it from next generations. So we also have to do good for people and planet. So well-being and do good for people and planet. And it's not that you have to do that because of a little girl or because of an old man. You have to do this not for Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum that says, hey, this is the moment for the Great Reset. That's not the reason. The very reason that you have to do it is for your kids and your grandkids. I'm a granddad, so I care about the future. And I don't want my grandchildren to look at you and ask, what have you done? What was your impact? Have you stopped it? Have you reversed it? Or did you do like nothing? You can't live like that anymore as a company. What I've also learned from my grandchildren is to do this, to have imagination. This is an amazing scene out of Cinderella. Cinderella wants to go to the ball. And then the fairy, fairy godmother comes up with a pumpkin and the mice. And Cinderella looks at it and she says, but this is not going to take me to the ball. And then the fairy godmother says, but Cinderella, try to look at things not as they are, but look at things as they can become. And I think this is what we need to do in business, to look at the things at our building blocks, not as they are, but as they can become. And that also counts, especially for, for procurement department. We have to reimagine stuff. We have to reimagine how we deal with food, how we deal with water, how we deal with energy, how we deal with society, how we deal with everything. Now, we have to turn the tide. We have to turn the world upside down again and make it normal again and make it livable. That's creating impact. Impact, not impact to make profit, but make profit to make impact, to make profit to make more impact. We all know what Patagonia has done last week. This is exactly what we need to do. That's real impact. That's taking it to the next level. Create profit to create impact, to be profitable, to create even more impact. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be extremely complex. Why? Because it's all interrelated. If one element falls, all the rest will follow. So we will be confronted with the data overload. We will be confronted with a lot of variables. And people are not good in dealing with variables. People are not good in optimizing variables. But luckily, we will have the assistance of augmented intelligence. Our human brain being assisted by the computing power and the, uh, the, the, of the computing power of artificial intelligence and the fact that artificial intelligence is very good in optimizing many variables. And we, as human beings, are bad. But we can better judge what is good for people and what is not good for people. So these are the three technologies that are going to impact your business tremendously in the next five to 10 years. Big data, artificial intelligence, and autonomization. So we're entering a data-driven economy, an economy that will be about collecting, processing, and activating data. And why are we processing and activating data? To try to find the ultimate well-being for our customers and create smart healthcare, smart food, smart living, smart agriculture, smart energy, um, smart shopping, smart traffic, and smart being data-driven and good for people and planet. And if you think about smart mobility, if you think about the car of the future, the car of the future will be a self-driving car and a battery on four wheels. But if you think about that, it's a battery on four wheels. So you see that the automotive industry is blending with the utilities industry. 
and is blending with the entertainment industry. Because if it's a self-driving car, a car becomes an entertainment center. That's the reason why Sony is investing in cars. But at the same time, it'll be also a marketing instrument. So what you see is that many industries are blurring into one industry. Healthcare, what's the difference between healthcare and the food industry? And the food industry and sports, and sports and wearables. So also there, you see at least four or five industries are melting down into one new type of industry. What we're going to see in the next five to 10 years is the blurring of industry lines. And it's not only a blurring of industry lines, but it's also a blurring of the supply chains. What's the difference between a supplier and a manufacturer, and a manufacturer and a wholesaler, and a wholesaler and a retailer? That becomes very difficult, because everybody's trying to move into the other territory. It's going to end up in a gigantic red ocean. And in a red ocean, everybody is going to try to fight for his own position or working together. And that's the rise of the ecosystems. So the question is to ecosystem or not the ecosystem. That's the question of the future. Out of this bloody red ocean, ecosystems will rise. What's an ecosystem? How do you build a company that is future-proof for an uncertain future. You have to be responsive. You have to be learning, and you have to have an impact on your environment. Remember, Charles Darwin was wrong, so you have to have an impact. You have to build a company like a human being. If I take, and that's why the water is here, if I take a glass of water, I think it's fresh, but it might be boiling hot. How do I know it's boiling hot? Because in my fingers, I've got sensors. And those sensors sense something. But those sensors are stupid. My hands know nothing. They just sense data. And those data have to be sent to my brain. And in my brain, they are being processed into information. And that, that information is being sent back to my hand with an order, let go, before you burn your hand and you burn your insides. These are the building blocks of an ecosystem. You need sensors. You need a body. You need a nervous system. You need a brain. And you need applications, things that you do. That's how you make an impact, and that's how you learn. So every ecosystem needs to have a brain, a brain, a central brain that is responsive and learning and can have an impact. But the brain as such is nothing. A brain needs a good infrastructure. So companies with a good infrastructure, companies with a good backend, companies with a good ERP system, it's not a waste of time and energy because you need a healthy body to have a healthy brain. But most companies forget also to collect data, build as many sensors in and outside of your organization that collect data. Because without data, you're completely blind. So the more data you can collect, the more you will be able in the future to react to something that you didn't know that you had to react to when it's there. You need to support collecting data with a network, because if the data stick to my fingers and not end in my brain, I have a problem. If the information in my brain doesn't flow back to my hand, I have a problem. So every company needs to become a network. In the brain, you don't make money. On the platform, you don't make money. You just turn the data into information. And where do you make your money? Not in the memory, but you make your money in the actions what you do between you as a company and the outside world. That's where, you make, that's where you make your money. Now, if you involve other companies in your ecosystem, because you will not be able to do everything by your own, that means that companies that contribute to the ecosystem share data with you. The data that you turn into information, that information has to be fed back to the companies that participate to the ecosystem. And their autonomy, because everybody that participates to an ecosystem thinks, oh, where is my autonomy? The autonomy is what do you do with the information? Every company can turn that information into new business models, into new, into new products, and into new services. That's how you build an ecosystem. And then you start to learn by acting. You do something, you learn out of the market. What you learn from the market is data. You feed that data back to the platform, the platform gets better. The information on the platform gets better. If the information is better, you can build better products. If you build better products, you have more data. And then you start to build a sustainable business model. 
Every ecosystem runs on data. If I can give you good advice, as from tomorrow, start to collect data. Data not to upsell or to cross-sell or to deep-sell. Customers don't like that. What customers want you to do with data is to know your customer, to inspire your customer, to recognize your customer, to do stuff for your customer that your customer values. So you have to show your heart. Every company in the future has to show their heart. Be honest, be ethical, be authentic, take your responsibility and be transparent. If you're not, you're lost. If you have a heart, you can survive the twilight 20s. So remember, ecosystems run on data. Ecosystems balances autonomy on one hand and collaboration on the other hand. In an ecosystem, there are no winners. So it's not a good old procurement where you try to win and you try to be stronger in the supply chain. There is no winner in an ecosystem. And the raison d'etre of an ecosystem is impact, creating impact. But it's got devastating effects. The devastating effects is that we, if we think that we survived the first wave of digitization, we haven't seen anything yet. It still has to start, it still has to come. And don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Don't do what you did yesterday all the time. You know, the beach chair model, putting beach chairs on the beach and renting beach chairs. You know, what you do in the morning, you wake up a little bit early and we steal a row from competition. And then you have your market chair, you increase your market chair. But for the rest of your day, you're locked up in your market chair. So you go to procurement and you say, buy smaller chairs, buy them in China, they're the cheaper, give them fancy colors, all that type of stuff, and you're very good at it. But you're not watching the ocean. And when there is a new wave approaching the, the, your beach, you don't even see it. And when that wave turns into a tsunami, and you don't see the tsunami, the only thing you can do is scream and run. But you're so busy with your beach chairs that you don't even see the tsunami coming. And even if you see that small wave on the horizon, you're going to minimize the wave. You're going to say, yeah, but the wave is not that big and the impact is not going to be that huge, and I've still got plenty of time. What you need to avoid is becoming the fire department. And why do I say that? Has anybody seen this, Chernobyl? If the first episode reminds you of your own company, scream and run. Sorry. Um, what happens? What happens is this. You know, something bad happens. Boom, a nuclear explosion, the virus, you know? And then what most companies say after the virus, let's go back to the good old normal. That's also what happens in Chernobyl. You know, the script. Something bad happens and let's use the scripts of the old world. And I disengage right, the clutch. I'll pump. disconnect the servos from the standby console. You two get the backup pumps running. We need water moving through the cord. That is all that matters. The good old procedures. We, re we need water running through the core. And then you, from procurement, all of a sudden you realize that the outside world has changed, that the old rules don't apply. And you walk in and this is there what you no say. There is no core. It exploded. The core exploded. There is no core. There is no old world anymore, so the procedures of the old world are not going to work. That's what you're going to scream. And you know, this is what is He's going to happen. Shop. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. They're not going to listen to you. And then this happens. We're wasting time. Let's go. Get the hydrogen out of the generators and pump water into the core. What about the fire? Call the fire brigade. What about the fire? Call the fire brigade. You don't want to be the fire brigade. When there's a fire, you don't want to be the fire brigade. You need to be the guy that walks in, that runs in and says there is no old world anymore. When you're obliged to do procurement like it used to be, you're doing the wrong stuff. You're doing the old procedures in a new world. So have the guts to tell whoever is giving you the instructions that the instructions no longer apply. And don't wait until you are being asked to be the fire brigade because you do not want to be the fire brigade. Now, you can't go back and change the beginning. You can't go back and restore it, but you can look where you are and change the future. So, dear procurement people, take the pen and write your own scripts. Don't wait for somebody to write the scripts for you. Don't wait for somebody to call you and ask you to be the fire brigade. You can write your own scripts 
there's never been a better moment to do that. Now, before I end my keynote, I want to give you one good advice. Use your superpower. There's a superpower that all of us has, and that superpower is this, curiosity. If you want to survive the twilight zone, whatever department you're in, you have to have passionate curiosity because passionate curiosity is going to help you. Why passionate curiosity? You know what is curiosity? Curiosity is what happens to me when I go shop with my wife and my two grown daughters in the shopping center. This is what happens. And, and yeah, but sorry, I can't do this in, this is not good anymore. In gender neutral times, I can't do it. But forget that it's about men or women, although you recognize it, no doubt. But this is about two types of companies. Most companies run that company like I do my shopping. You know, I on the ball, I have my five year plan, I don't get distracted. But then you never see the next opportunity or the next big threat. You're never going to see that wave that approaches your beach that is going to turn into a tsunami. So I do a plea for companies, also you, to apply more curiosity in what you do. Be curious about the outside world. The fact that you're here is that you're curious, so that's good. If you're curious, you will never become the fire department. So implement a new KPI, the net curiosity score. If you can enhance the net curiosity score in your organizations, you will never be disrupted. There's a good reason to do that. And if you are curious, then you're ready. And let the games begin. Take the pen, write your own scripts, and be leading in the change, and don't let the change lead you. Remember Darwin, it's not adapting to the environment, adapt your environment. I wish you good luck with it. Thank you.